Mark Chow. How are you, sir? Yo, can you hear me? It is. I can hear you perfectly. I, I apologize for the un, unpicturesque uh, backdrop. Yeah, I got to learn how to uh, install like backdrops. Like my friend Eric Koo has this beautiful library with like an ease chair on it. But I've just got some <laughs> filing cabinets. <laughs> I want to I okay. put like, a big weed, a big hydroponic weed shop behind <laughs> as my backdrop. <laughs> that was good, man. That's right. good. Or at least some rake branding. Rake or revolution right. some branding. Rake or revolution branding. We're like a nudist colony. Like, you know, oh. there's just one na naked city in France. Um, and and uh, so I'd like, I'd like just a backdrop of that would be great. Oh, I like that. <laughs> okay. I want to I put on a jacket as well, then. <sighs> Oh, I can take off my jacket. It's okay. No, 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 Mark. I've never seen you take your jacket off. You probably sleep in a jacket. Mark, do you sleep in a jacket? Yes, I have a sleeping jacket. That's exactly what the sleeping jacket is. <laughs> you know, when I when I first um, went to Charve, I was super enamored with, like, you know, the velvet robe that they have. I mean, this velvet smoking mm -hmm. jacket with a sash. And I thought it'd be such, I, I thought it'd be so cool to have that jacket and, and wear it on the plane. <laughs> so I remember I stuffed did it. Did you do it? My, my, yeah, I did. I, I stuffed it into my carry-on luggage. <laughs> Incidentally, that thing is huge. It's incredibly bulky. And then, okay. like, you know, as I sort of changed into my pajamas, so I also bought the Charvet um, black pajamas with the white piping on it, and I bought a burgundy, you know, I bought a velvet smoking jacket. And I oh. <laughs> I came out into the plane and just sat down and, you know, ordered champagne. And I, 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 everyone kind of looked at me like, what what a tool. You know? <laughs> like, to hell with them. Putting on the Forget about those exactly. guys. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I liked it. You know, it was interesting because when my father uh, was flying, you know, back in the, the 60s and the 70s, people used to get really well dressed to take their flights. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was kind of a social occasion as well. And he would. Yeah, he always he would always wear a suit to go take a flight. And you know, it's a pity mm -hmm. that that doesn't kind of happen anymore. You know. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I wonder if people start dressing up a little bit more for flying after COVID. I, okay. I'm not, I'm not holding my breath though. Let's put it that way. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> Nor am I. Okay. Yeah, so that, like, that, that's a very pertinent comment because that's the question I want to ask you, Mark, is mm -hmm. how has, uh, everyone's talked about casualization. Everyone's talked about, you know, how there's been a deracination of like the sort of formal codes. Um, people are just going to live in sweatpants for the rest of their lives. Um, so what is it from your perspective? How has the last year permanently or altered the way in which people will dress? Or do you think there will be a return to formality and suiting and tailoring? Uh, I think there will be a return, but it might not be back to levels like it was before. Um, I think part of this is more at a, at a, at a, at a bigger level, right? putting on my business hat, like people have reduced the amount of office space that they're using. Like companies have reduced the amount of office square footage that they have. And so not as many, they're already planning for not as many people to be in the office as before, you know? And if you're only gonna be at the office three days a week, four days a week, and you're gonna work from home one of those days, like I think your kind of formal office -y type wardrobe will reduce slightly. And given that now you have this like kind of usurper day in terms of your formal versus casual where um, in the in the work week, I think that casual will leak into the work week even more than before. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, what do you think that uh, of like the, the relevance of tailoring for the future, but, you know, sort of paired with more casual um, garments such as the Hawaiian shirt, for example? I love it. You know, I think that like I got into this work because I really love tailoring and because I'd like right. to perpetuate it and make sure it hangs around, right? Like it's such a beautiful art form. It's such a beautiful form of design and engineering. And so whatever form it survives in, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with. I don't feel the need to like stick to those old codes necessarily um, as long as the concept of tailoring still exists, right? And by concept of tailoring, I mean like, um, I mean like, you know, garments that have lapels that have a certain construction in the shoulder that have canvassing like garments that are three dimensional rather than two dimensional. That is really what the, the crux of tailoring for me, rather than necessarily it having to have to be like, Oh, it has to be in charcoal. Or it has to be in Navy, blah, blah, blah. 
Right. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I went through a, a period where I wasn't wearing a lot of tailoring and I've only started to sort of re-embrace it. And I think it was it was kind of concurrent with my finally losing the weight that I gained during COVID, right? Because I kind of let oh, it all okay. go. You know, I was, I was comfort eating. I, I just got kind of fat and pasty. I became basically a functional alcoholic. Um, okay. And then, no, then I made a concerted effort because, of course, we can all see the end in sight as well, right? There's kind of been a renewal mm. of hope. There's a light at the end of the proverbial sort of tunnel. Um, and mm. I'm going to want to see people again. I'm going to want to interact with my friends. I want to mix with society as well. And I'm looking forward to mm. that with, you know, sort of inordinate um, pleasure. And I want to look mm. good. And I think that that's part of the human compulsion, like, right? And the thing about tailoring for me, which is so wonderful, is that it's about a dialogue, right? It's about you mm. being able to express who you are. You know, you're not being dictated to from a fashion designer or whatever, although in some instances that works well. Um, you get to sort of manifest what is sort of within you in terms of, of mm -hmm. the three-dimensional sculpture that you wear. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. It may be worn in different ways. I agree with you. I think people wear it with like T-shirts or denim shirts or polos or what have you, you know. But mm -hmm. I think that there's also going to be moments where people want to look, you know, sort of irrepressibly beautiful, right? And, and, and yeah. in those occasions, they're going to want to, you know, a turn down collar shirt and they're going to want a beautiful Mm -hmm. necktie as well. Every human being has a compulsion to look like the best version of who they are, and tailoring is very mm -hmm. much part of that equation for me. I mean, even beyond looking the best, um, there's also just since time immemorial, you know, like people want to want to realize what they think they look like to the outside world, and clothing Correct. plays a huge part of that. I mean, look at every single culture, every period of history. You know, there's always been, I guess. Fashion clothing has always reflected the zeitgeist of those cultures and those times. Yes. You know? And just so happens right now for us and for, I guess, maybe for me personally, like I just like tailoring. Tailoring, I find, is the most convenient and most accurate way of like realizing myself and my customers. Absolutely. I think Proust once said, um, uh, style is that world that each of us sees and that is unseen by others. Right. And you're absolutely right. It's about making manifest who you believe that you are through your, what you wear. Mm. Um, I think there's also a nice, nice dimension to it, which is very timely as well. I think that for millennials and for Generation Z, but I think for all of us, we're also talking about consuming less. Right. Which is super important because we basically fuck this mm. planet almost out of existence. And when you make or purchase clothing that you wear forever. Right. I mean, mm. there's nothing better than that from a sort of like ecological perspective. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I really believe in trying to reuse clothing and trying to repair it and keep it going you know and I'm, it's always the best garments that are, it's always the best garments are always the ones that you've managed to wear for a long time and you've really settled into and it's just become a part of you it's just become an extension of you right in fact it reminds me of like right now in europe especially um it hasn't caught up so much in the us but right now in europe especially like the momentum for right to repair is really growing you know right to repair as in like um, electronics manufacturers can no longer make devices that the user or at least a service center has a certain amount of ability to repair without just discarding the whole thing. I think that's, that's really amazing. Important. I think it's great. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think one like of the greatest... iPhones having captive batteries, that's like an example of like, that's not a good, that's not right to repair. You can't even replace that thing yourself, you know? Absolutely. You know, and, and for, for me, I've always um, been a bit suspicious that there was a sort of, you know, engineered anachronism that was happening with all these electronic devices, right? Every year, you know, every two years is a different sort of pin that you need or a different plug or one doesn't yeah. kind of, you know, work with the other. And it's, it's quite yeah. irritating. And I, I absolutely applaud that. I think it's great. Right. Hope, and hopefully the brands embrace it. I guess they'll have to, right? Like brands like Apple. Yeah, I guess if something like as big a block as the EU embraces something like that, right? It's too much trouble to 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 design a bunch of versions of the same hardware. So they'll just go with kind of the lowest common denominator, which would be stuff that's easily repairable, stuff that has serviceable parts. Amazing. So, Mark, I, I, before we get into your your lookbook, um, I wanted to also say I have a huge admiration. Well, I, I've always admired you. I think you're a great guy. Oh, um, come on. I, but, but I also have seen that their people have responded to the, the challenging year in different ways. And I really admire the fact that you basically want to become an even greater content creator than before. You know, I, I think it was tireless. I think you, you basically made a video almost every single day. And it was really quite uplifting. I mean, you know, I was sitting oh, there thanks, in my man. room as my stomach was expanding. And I'm like, wow, I'm learning so much about style through Mark. I'm thinking about interesting combinations or ways to wear jackets or shirts or, or putting things together in, in really great ways. So at what point were you like, you know what, I'm just not going to like 
you know, <laughs> bury my head in the sand. I'm going to get out there and I'm going to talk to people and talk about style. Right. Oh man. It was like, af it was like, it was about this time last year, you know, it was literally almost one year ago because I was sitting right. at home doing quarantine. Like I'd come back from New York and I had to do the two week quarantine at home, which was fine. Actually, I really enjoyed like having some peace and quiet at home for two weeks. But I was like, God, I really miss talking to customers. I really miss talking about this sort of stuff. Um, so that's just how it got started, you know? And Amazing. the nice thing about during the COVID period is that expectations perhaps are a little bit lower um, in terms of like, it doesn't have to be beautifully produced. Like it can be quite raw and people will still appreciate it. Um, and that's kind of become our thing, I guess. Like we've slowly improved incrementally little parts of our production, but it's still, unscripted and we just kind of like oh this morning i think we'll talk about this that and the other and we just do it in like an hour and that's it yeah but you know that's what i like about it i want it feel yeah exactly it feels like a real conversation with with you um and i think that maybe one of the you know sort of benefits of um of the last period that we've been in is in some ways we are no longer enslaved to video productions necessarily being flashy or overly produced mm. i mean you know yeah. just listening to you speaking to your phone or I guess even this, you know, has enormous benefits to me. And, I, and, and, if, and there's mm. a proximity because it was a little bit raw as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like people always, I mean, this is why, for instance, you do so well on Instagram too, because you're always very authentic, right? Like you just speak your yes. mind. There's no, there's no like bullshit filter. <laughs> I, I, it was funny because when I first got into Instagram, I tried to be, you know, kind of like polished and all that. And, and, I, and I realized that just my aptitude was not to, to be kind of perfect all the time because I'm really, really not. And then the moment where I started to understand, you know, the cathartic use of Instagram and also people seem to respond to it in an entertaining way was when I was having meltdowns in the airport, right? Uh, when my flights got canceled. Which I one? Down <laughs> uh, <laughs> people seem to like them all, actually. Um, and I think that people also then would message me and DM me and then say, like, hey, I've had that same experience. I used that same airline that happened to me. I think the one that was like when I went to Luca Rubinacci's wedding in, uh, and and this Spanish airline, well, first off, showed up at Barcelona airport and like their entire electronic system was down, right? So they insisted on ticketing my bags. There was, first of all, a massive fucking line. And second of all, they insisted on ticketing my bags with a handwritten bag in a bag. And I'm like, dude, that's never going to get to the destination. And of course I show up at Luca Rubinacci's wedding and there's nothing there. So I had to basically buy everything I needed for that. Fortunately, my morning suit was being sent from Huntsman, right? But everything else, um, I had to, and everything for my wife as well had to be purchased um, in this sort of seaside Galatian, you know, fishing village called Vigo, which let me tell you, you know, like I had to, I need the black shoes, right? I need the black Oxfords and the only ones I could find had studs on them. <laughs> Don't ask me which brand it was. If someone looked down at my shoes, I think it was Fabio Atanasio. He just started cracking out. I'm like, dude. Right, and he's like, okay, okay. They're black, okay. Come on, give me a break. They're, they're, bl black. they're black, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I, I had the experience uh, last year of curating a collection of clothing for um, they're called the retailer garments, and I have to applaud you because it's actually really fucking hard, right? It's really hard to get things perfect in terms of details, in terms of fit. It's also really hard to come up with cool ideas. Um, but you do this and it seems to be almost second nature to you. So let's talk about the next collection that you've just launched. Tell me a little bit about this. So the next collection we launched um, was made, like we start putting the collections together a year in advance, right? So basically the collection right. was already in progress last March. And it was, you know, we were into COVID and we were all kind of holding our breaths. And we already think to ourselves, oh man, this could get really bad. This might actually affect our entire, um, like our entire look and our entire plans. So we really picked up the pace in terms of putting together clothing that was um, more casual, uh, still tailored, but you know, for instance, like we used a lot more linen than we ever used to. The models that we designed for it are much more sporty kinds of models. We cut way back on suits and we went heavier into jackets. And then we also put together a bunch of like mm, casual semi-tailored pieces. Um, so these are things like our three pocket blues on, uh, like our road jacket and actually come and if you give us another month or two, we will have our city hunter jacket uh, also in linens available. And we have a new version of the safari available. You know, and the reason for these semi-tailored pieces is because like once we've done those designs, we can actually make those designs in tailored cloths. 
because like tailored cloth is so beautiful. It's such a shame not to use that stuff, you know? Um, and so we wanted something that could reuse those traditional tailored cloths, but in a new form and allow people to enjoy those same cloth and those same designs, but in a new casual way. And then plus, perfect. we've never had a chance to use that much linen. And this year we used a lot of linen, which I'm really excited about. Because you know, so question people for you. will be like, oh, it's gotta be crisp. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's exactly the question I was gonna ask for you, ask you. Does it, like, so personally, like, well, I'm kind of, you know, bummy looking anyway, right? So personally, like, no, I love a, sup a super cr a wrinkled linen suit, right? Because it's hmm. like almost like you just slept in the train station because you got so drunk and you missed it, the train, which incidentally may or may not have happened to me. So, so hmm. like, I find that, but the uh, other people who I know who are more perfectionists, like when they see a, a linen suit, it's the moment you take it off the hanger where it's been perfectly ironed. Um, do you like both states of affairs? What's your philosophy related to linen? And because you've made quite a lot of it this season. Uh, I mean, I think you have to accept that it's going to be a little bit wrinkled and you have to kind of love it, you know, like you shouldn't expect that it's going to be perfectly pressed because it's going to be perfectly, it's going to survive in that perfectly unpressed, a perfectly pressed state for about one second. And the minute you have it on, <laughs> it's already going to start creasing. But I think right. it's also important, and this has been our philosopher linen, to use relatively heavy linens. Like when you do quite light linens, the wrinkles get quite extreme. They're not always very pleasant to look at. Whereas, like the linens on uh, the wrinkles on heavy linen are, are a lot more, they're a lot more gentle, you know, and they just feel like the garment's been lived in rather than the garment's been like crumpled up into a ball. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about the, the colorways that you have embraced for this uh, collection. Yeah, a lot of like a lot of earth tones. So, a lot of different, like a lot of different shades of like tan, cream, beige. Um, while paying a little bit more attention to texture. Um, so we didn't do so many patterns. We actually just did more textural things. Uh, like we have one that's a herringbone linen with quite a big herringbone. And it's got a nice variation between honey and dark brown. Um, awesome. We have, yeah, that one's great. It's the Model 12. And that's one that, for instance, like pairs well with denim, but can also be dressed up with a pair of wool trousers um, because it has that texture in the cloth. Um, there's another one that's beige silk and actually if you get close like in the beige It's obviously like kind of a natural OT color But then there's these little flecks of honey in it as well that mm -hmm. just look amazing And when you see it in real life and you realize that oh, it's silk and it has a slightly different feel to it It's a very kind of compelling garment as well. And then we that's did um, We did it because we don't we actually normally use Irish linens This is the first year we've right. really gone hard into Italian linens and I really like it because um, we managed to get some really heavy Solbiati Italian linen. And one of them has this, uh, they call it like an aloe finish. And it's really, really like creamy, smooth and soft. Very unusual feeling, but it feels great on the body. I uh, could live the entire summer in white suits or cream colored suits. How do you feel? I mean, you've made one, obviously, so you must like them. How do you feel about the color white? I love it. I, it's it's a tough sell, I tell you, but I, I like it. I try to recommend it to everybody who's even like remotely interested. And I think I get lucky <laughs> about 1% of the time. Um, I actually haven't done anything in white. I always do like ivory, like slightly, Great. slightly yellow. But I, yes. I think like in the lookbook, there's a photo of you like outside yes. of Harry's. And yes. that one was white, right? It's basically like, full on, you know, liquid paper white. Nice, nice. I like it. <laughs> thank, thank you. I, you know, because honestly, like, and people laugh when I say this, but one of the, the big style references for me is Miami Vice, right? The original television series mm. in the 80s. And mm. I, you know, as a kid, I think I was probably like 13 or 14 years old, um, when I saw like these characters and dress in this kind of like, sort of, I don't know, degage kind of irrepressible, you know, and for many years, people perceived it also to be quite tacky, but I just loved it. And, and if so, if I could just wear white suits with like pastel colored like t-shirts, um, I'd, be, I'd be perfectly happy. It, it was funny because- I like uh, the idea that you should do that for the rake. I, 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 well, actually it's funny that we basically have. So it's, huh. it's, it's, it's um, just a bunch of like white suiting. I think we have one tobacco and one blue, but everything else is white. So it goes from like ivory and then to just full on like again liquid paper white right um mm, but mm. and and yeah i think 
so you can pair it with Hawaiian shirts. You can pair it with pastel T-shirts. You can even pair it with, with what is, I think, a, a, in England, they call them vests. In, in America, they called, no, sorry. Yeah, in vests. And then I guess they call them singlets as well in America, right? There, there's another nickname for them, which I won't share. As it's, 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 it's not a... It's it's not a nice one, but anyway, like yeah. I've, I've even I, you could even wear it with that. Actually, it's funny because in, in PT Omo, I think two years ago, I was actually wearing um, a vest with a, a suit, and I was like, I wonder if anyone else is, thinks this is ridiculous, or I wonder if everyone thinks this is ridiculous looking. Although to be fair, it was very comfortable. And then, then Tom Stubbs, who I always I always like his style, kind of rocked up with an even better version of it because he had like a striped one on, and then all this kind of like again, like because having grown up in New York City like that kind of pimp jewelry, you know, like, so a whole, mm. whole bunch of, uh, do you, do you wear jewelry, Mark? I don't, I just wear a watch. All right. Yeah. What, what's, uh, what's the wrist check for today? Wrist check, a tech 96. Nice. Uh, yeah, man. The, oh, with a fly brigade numerals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is this was one that I had one. PP restore for me and um, they did an amazing job. I PP restore anything for me before, but this right. one was just, I, it took forever too. It took like two years for them to, for, of waiting for them to finish the restoration. Totally, totally worth it. So the question I would have for you also is how was business over the last year? Like, it seems like, um, like watches were going crazy for whatever reason. Mm. Um, and then clothing kind of hit and miss. I mean, I'm not talking about the armory because I'm just talking about in general. What, yeah. what was your experience like? I mean, like, you know, let's be frank. It was definitely not what it used to be. Um, right. the armory is kind of an odd one because a lot of our business is trunk shows, you know, visiting tailors coming to see our customers and nobody's traveling. So the right. tailors aren't even coming to see the customers. Right. Um, people still need clothes. Like for instance, in Hong Kong, the lockdowns weren't too bad. I mean, they weren't great, but they were certainly better than like other parts of the world. And so people were still dressing, people were still getting stuff um, to, you know, they wanted new things to go out in. Um, the work wardrobe obviously kind of fell to the wayside a little bit, but people still wanted to buy clothes. So they just ended up buying kind of more casual things. And it was right. good timing on our part too, because we were already planning a lot of kind of more casual things like casual tailoring models, um, as well as like those kind of casual semi-tailored pieces I was talking about earlier. So we were selling a lot of that sort of thing, yeah. I think the one that took a really big hit though was shoes. Like it's ah. been a lot tougher to sell shoes. It's funny you say that because people are always like, when I normally when I'm at home, I have on my shelf, my collection of shoes. Um, many of them are bespoke shoes, which by virtue of being bespoke are incredibly uncomfortable. But, but anyway, the, uh, I've been there. I know I mean, what you're talking about. <laughs> but it, it's a collection of shoes that basically haven't seen, I think, pavement in almost a year as well. So, yeah, you're absolutely right related to that. Um, and, and Mark, like, you know, when you are able to travel again, right, which I don't think will be that, that far in the future, where would you like to go and what would you like to do? Oh, man, I'd really like to get back to New York. I haven't seen my shops in New York in like a year now. And... Um, I don't know. You know, we had a lot of really interesting plans with the shops in New York, a lot of interesting events that we just had to put on hiatus for the time being, uh, as well as like our latest shop, the one on the Upper East Side. That one still has a bit of um, refurbishment that I'd like to complete. And I just haven't been able to go back and kind of finish those last touches. So I'd really like to go back there, finish the shops, see all the customers, see all the teams, and also just all these friends I haven't seen in a long time. And after that, uh, Tokyo, well, Japan in general, like there's so many relationships over there that like I need to kind of, I mean, we call regularly, but it's not the same. You know, you really want to see those guys face to face and like have a good drink and have a good chat. Uh, so Japan's next on the list and then UK as well. I mean, I haven't seen my apartment there in a year as well. I've had a friend staying there the whole time. So it's at least it's like not derelict yet. Um, right. But yeah, I, I miss like everything we had set up there, you know, the Drake stuff, the building. Yeah, it's a bummer a little bit. Uh, and then That's finally Italy. Setup. Yeah, I mean, you must miss partners. Italy too, right? 
Well, you know, I, first of all, I miss hanging out with friends like yourself, uh, like actually hanging out with them and rather than doing sort of virtual, you know, at one point I think Shari had instituted like a, a Zoom cigar smoking session. Um, and I think I tried to do some like, uh, like <laughs> Zoom like dinners, but it was, you know, in some ways it was kind of depressing, right? Because it's not, it's mm. not the actual thing, right? Uh, and it mm. almost feels not, not Shari's um, a Zoom cigar session, but sometimes it feels a little bit forced. Um, I have to say, I'm really impressed with the expansion of the Armory internationally. And maybe you can tell us oh, a little thanks, bit about man. that. So you now have two shops in New York. You've got the Crosby Street shop in Soho, which was the first one. And then you've got a Upper East Side shop as well now, from what, uh, correct? And then in London- So it's actually a, Tribeca. Uh, so the Crosby Street shop is the Drake shop. And then the oh, uh, so Wayne Street shop- No, no, no worries. Right. No, no, no worries. Uh, yeah, Tribeca and Upper East Side. So. Right. So, okay, actually, let's talk about that because you have basically two, two brands, right? You've got Drake's, which is an amazing brand, um, and it's a, a British brand that has somehow become the brand for – if you're that young guy and you're interested in all things tutorial, that's the brand you go to, right, I, I think, you know? And then I, and, and I, I love the, the value proposition that Drake's offers. I mean, it's, I think it was one of the first sort of tailoring brands to maintain the quality, but actually reduce the price quite significantly so people could get into clothing, right, at a much earlier age or with greater oh, accessibility, right? Mm. So that's a very important brand. And, I, and you know, I, I was just talking to Lorenzo Schiffinelli because he was saying, listen, you know, we're in a war for the hearts and minds of the next generation. And if you make something like tailoring so inaccessible to them, right, they're, mm. they're never just going to get into it because it's like, why? You know, yeah. I can't, I can't afford it, right? As simple as that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then, and then the armory is, is, uh, is, a, is quite a remarkable place. It's, it was actually quite interesting because I, there used to be such amazing mixed sort of label, really well curated men's shops in New York City, right, or around the mm. world. But one mm. by one, they've kind of fallen by the wayside. You know, I think the, um, the, the last one and the one I, I used to love to go to was one called FR Tripler, right, which was in New York. Um, um, and I think I bought my first like Hickey Freeman, like uh, overcoat from there, like something like that. You know, all these great. What American was it called? Uh, Hickey Freeman. Oh, it was called FR Tripler. And it used to carry Hickey Freeman, Oxford, like uh, Alt Peel, like all these kind of like mm. cool American you know, brands. Mm. Um, and then it just, yeah, sadly kind of fell by the wayside. Um, mm. But then, and, and it was getting quite like depressing, actually. If you're a guy that's into classic clothing, the whole scene in New York was, was it just, there was just nothing there for you until the Drake's and the, Ar and the Armory opened, right? Like how, how have those shops like could have empowered the sartorial communities there and how have they become kind of like, not just shops, but like kind of community centers as well? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, you know, it's funny. It, it, it reminds me of like when we started in Hong Kong, I was talking to um, Patrick Chu, who's the head cutter at WW Chan. And you know, when we started the army in Hong Kong, like they were actually, uh, like we were their representative on Hong Kong side because their shop was in Kowloon. And so we, they could actually send their customers to our shop to do fittings and whatnot, which was great. And Patrick the other day was saying to me, oh, you know, when you guys, as in referring to like me, Alan, and a couple of other guys in our sort of circle of, I do or... Oh, sorry. I had a call a second. Um, Al, Patrick was saying that, oh, you guys were basically the first crop of young guys that we had seen since basically like when we started our business, um, which I thought was super interesting uh, because I guess like that was a very clear demarcation of like the last generation, the new generation, you know? And now 10 years on, I think we're probably ready for like a new generational shift. Like, so that last generational shift 10 years ago was about mad men coming back and about people wanting to wear suits in the first place. Right. And it was also right. about like wanting soft tailoring. So people wanted that classic look, but it was very like Italian focused, Southern Italian focused, classical Italia. Like that was that era. And I think now uh, as we're entering the next era, it's going to be very much about just like, casual tailoring which is kind of what we're still trying to figure out right now you know it doesn't the softness is already taken for granted so there's got to be a new thing for this new generation yeah it's funny also you know when i first started the rake um which i think it was like uh, 13 years ago right and and when i and i think people forget actually that tailoring was not in good shape 
right? 13 years ago, or even, you know, it's, mm. it, it was in some ways on a decline. And then suddenly there was, you know, there was this resurgence in interest for it, uh, so thanks to people mm. like yourself. But when I first went to, you know, for example, to Savile Row, and, and I said, hey, I, you know, I really want to write stories about you guys for, for my magazine, people were genuinely perplexed. <laughs> like, really? Um, and it's nice to see, like, you know, a decade later, there's a lot of tailors, you know, during normal circumstances that are struggling with capacity issues because they have so many mm. orders, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's a great thing to see. Um, and I think that that's because of there is a very strong collective in terms of the, you know, I'm quite a bit older than you, Mark, but, of, but, but I think we're from the same generation of people who found, or just, you know, who found tailoring. Um, and I think uh, social media obviously played an immense role in that as well. Um, but you're right. It, it's, you know, what was interesting too. I think like when, when it first started off, it was all about softness and it was all about, you know, sort of like zero padding and, you know, neoprene mm -hmm. shoulders and that kind of thing. Um, and then for whatever reason, like I quite got into shoulder pads. I think it was because I love, I've always loved Tommy Nutter, right? And then, and then I started like getting suits made by guys that used to work in Nutter, right? You know, like, so hmm. Edward Sexton, for example, who was actually, he was making all the Tommy Nutter suits and he was probably the, the brain behind that, all the technical stuff anyway. Guys like um, uh, Joe Morgan as well, you know? Hmm. Uh, and then, yeah. and it's interesting because- And Michael Brown and Chiffinelli too. Right, so then like Michael Brown, basically carried on that style but reintroduced it to a new generation and all of a sudden young people kind of got shoulder pads again right like mm -hmm. i think like yeah. it, it was um i think alex fekovich who i have to say was a, a super smart guy he was like one of the first young people i saw that was just rocking like shoulder pads and then and then, yeah. <laughs> then at some point everyone was rocking like um like you know like like, like saddle shaped like you know like uh um, shoulders as well and then I, I think everyone realized like okay we're getting a bit too extreme here we're gonna pull it back a little bit and and Schifanelli, yeah you know uh, obviously they have a super expressive shoulder too so mm. I, I i think that the thing that i like today is that there's room for everything Thing, right like i think there's mm. there are people that are, are sophisticated enough and knowledgeable enough that they they like mm. everything like when i meet young people i'll meet them like the same guy going to panico who will be going to liverano but then he'll go to joe morgan right or he'll go to michael mm. brown and it's and it's mm. like you do it, but it's and he's like it's specifically because they're completely different that i want to have these things mm. and that's what yeah. i like about today and and mm. i completely agree with you it's about figuring out what the future will be but again, you know, I, I still have um, a lot of confidence that that what because the fundamental codes that were created for menswear, at least the menswear that we love, ha, has not dramatically changed in you know 100 years or more, right? Um, Absolutely. And when we look, you know, and and the last thing too also is that, and it's funny because because I think that men sometimes forget that a lot of times when we're dressed up, it's because we also want to appeal to the the opposite, far more intelligent gender. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've never known a woman like to ever say, wow, that guy in the Balenciaga poncho, um, he looks amazing. Right. It's like, what a gorgeously dressed man that is, <laughs> you know, right. Come on. So, no comment. You know, right. So, so, you know, I wonder where he got that poncho. <laughs> it's, it's curious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> got like letters that's big, like running across it. Well, or as, uh, um, I, every woman, or at least every intelligent, you know, well, uh, or woman that that I find really cool, like who, when they look at a man and if he's wearing a beauty, just something as simple as a beautifully cut blazer, right? Like, and in a very nice and very understated way, she's like, wow, he looks good, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I do feel as if, as long as men are interested to, you know, be attractive to to the, as I said, far more intelligent and, and more wonderful gender, uh, I think that there's always going to be space for tailoring. Right? You know, it, one because what you touched on, kind of something that's been on my mind recently, um, since we've been around for ten years, is to what extent do you grow up with your customers, and to what extent do are you able to attract younger people, right? Um, for instance, the armory in Hong Kong in the Landmark, okay? The Landmark being this very nice mall has built out this new section called Below Ground. And Below Ground is all about like hype. It's about a lot of pop-ups. It's about, you know, uh, like Fragment did a thing there. It's like that sort of hype beast style, which like, it's great. I just don't get it at all myself. And 
I assume I don't get it because I'm just not that demographic anymore. You know, like I, I don't really know how to connect to that generation. The best I can do is like do my thing and then hope that they like it. But it's, it, is, it is a funny feeling to, to start thinking about like, uh, or when you watch other brands try to appeal to a new generation and they do it badly, it's so yes. cringy, you know? And so yeah, you kind of want to avoid that too. Okay. But so okay, what does so that mean? Like, do you just always stick with your customers for the rest of your life? Because you also need some new blood eventually, otherwise your business right. will die. I, you know, it's funny you say that because um, we're about to launch a project with Lorenzo Schifanelli, and the objective there is to create Schifanelli clothing that has all the codes of Schifanelli, but at a price that he's never done anything like that before. So much cheaper than obviously his bespoke stuff, which is very expensive, but understandably so. It's it's a couture, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Much more, uh, much less expensive than even his own ready to wear and, and when i asked why did he do that it's specifically because i want to bridge to the next generation but in terms of what mm. you do stylistically yeah. i would say um and i would take a page from ralph lauren so you know at one point basically polo clothing became co-opted by rap culture right like and it became mm. this thing where like it, they even had a culture called the low boys right or the uh and and the 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 guys would actually, I think they primarily boosted the clothing, but but anyway, at some point, polo, and especially the more colorful, expressive um, version of polo, right, it became everything that rappers were aspired to wear. And, and I think this is pre precisely embodied by, you know, Raekwon from the Wu-Tang Clan wearing the famous Snow Beach um, uh, jacket from uh, when he was, he was making the video for Could It All Be So Simple. Uh, and then you had Kanye West wearing the, the polo bear and all this kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, I asked Ralph Lauren, it's like, you know, what did you think of this? And he said he thought it was great, you know, and he's always, always been one of those forward thinking guys. Bear in mind that he was the first guy to ever use a, a black model for the face of his like high end brand. You know, he saw Tyson. No, way, I didn't like, know that. That's the guy. Yeah. The first one ever to, to use a black model, male model for the face of his brand. Um, but he said, but the but he said, I never pandered. Right. Like he didn't create clothing for that demographic in the same way he wouldn't create clothing for any demographic he just made what he mm. loved and that's why they mm. liked it because it was authentic you know what i mean so whereas you mm. had um tommy hilfiger and tommy hilfiger specifically tried to target that market um and you know would actually try to you know ingratiate that brand no no offense you know no no disrespect to tommy hilfiger is a brilliant businessman obviously but but he tried to go after that market and as a result it kind of caught on initially and then there was no continuity to it because it was inauthentic in that regard you know mm -hmm. so i guess you know you 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 can't compete with or you can't convince someone that's really interested in streetwear to necessarily to to make that transition to tailoring they need to convince themselves right and i think mm -hmm. the way you convince them is they're like what's interesting about streetwear um is it's a very knowledge-based culture right so it's a culture where in order to understand why one pair of sneakers cost $1,000 as opposed to another pair of sneakers that cost $100, it's all based on knowledge. So one of the things that I realized actually is there is a conversion happening where people who are super into streetwear are now becoming watch guys. Why? Because watches also are super knowledge based as well, right? Yeah. But if you can also appeal to them because of the storytelling, because it's genuinely authentic and based on knowledge, because tailoring is very knowledge based as well, right? There's mm -hmm. obscure shoulders that I still don't even can't, can't even wrap my head around. There's all kinds of stuff, right? Um, then I think that there might be a possibility there because you could also imagine that people who are streetwear guys, they eventually, you know, go, get, grow a bit older. And sure, I know people kind of continue with that style for all eternity, but they may also be interested to, to wear tailoring in specific. You know, I'll tell you one of yeah. the reasons why I, I also love tailoring. And, and it's not because I'm trying to impress people or whatever, right? But if I'm wearing something nice, like like a nicely tailored jacket or suit or what have you, right? Um, you just get treated in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so like, for example, one of my favorite places in the world is the Gritty Palace in, in Venice, you know? 
And like, it was important to me to want to go there and become like a regular there. Right. You know? Um, mm. And so the, the barman, you know, they knew my name and we were having conversations and we had fun, but part of it also, part of that journey, which I, I hope I've accomplished was dressing in a way that respected the place. Right. Mm. And, and for me, that was in tailoring, you know, and, and when you have like your Italian barman, like saying, Oh, I love your jacket or something like that, you know, that, that mm. it's very meaningful. Right. Like that's the guy I would mm. prefer to impress rather than uh, I, I want to impress my bartender, not, not, not not the average you know whoever like one of my fellow guests you know um mm. and 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 i think that's it it that's feeling that sense of confidence right so that you can go to any place in the world right and i would also say part of that also and maybe this is a bit controversial is also because i'm a minority right so i and and you know you can see what's happening in the united states right now and it's completely fucked up but i mm -hmm. would say that having grown up in the united states the the vast majority of my life and was born there, there was always to some degree a subtle undercurrent that I could detect. I've always said it's a bit like an existential malaise, but like we're, hmm, I'm not sure if I'm being treated in the same way, right? And so clothing for me was a way in which I was like, hey, you know, right? Like, I feel like I look great. And so fuck off, right? <laughs> you know? And, and I know it yeah. is for like young guys like Ray Chu as well. Um, and, but it was, it was important for me to be like properly, like correctly dressed in whatever situation I was in. Right. I mean, also, especially when you're young, right? When you're young, yes. you feel you, you're just a lot more insecure. And yes. clothing can be very helpful for kind of papering over where you think your gaps are. Eventually, as you get yes. older, those gaps get filled. But clothing is like a pretty useful stopgap for that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is everyone I know who was is crazy about Ralph Lauren, right? Oftentimes, it's because they had an insecurity about themselves, right? So um, I've talked about, I've written about how Alexander Kraft, for example, who's now launched his own brand, like part of it was when he went for a school interview, he was told by the, his examiner that you don't have enough confidence. And for him, Ralph Lauren was a pathway to that confidence, which he later achieved in life. You know, um, I was very awkward at one point and acutely aware of being different from all my white friends. Uh, and Ralph Lauren, or that style, was a way for me to feel like a character from a film almost, right? Like, you know, um, mm. and it gave me confidence. So I do, I, I, there is a, a transformative, transformative ability to clothing as well. I don't know. Um, mm. Mark, uh, it's been a pleasure catching up with you, sir. Congratulations. You too, on man. It's collection. been a while. Oh, we got to go out for dinner sometime. It's been a while. It, it, we absolutely have to. I really miss those meals. I also miss those kind of like spontaneous like lunches that like kind of go on for quite a few hours as well. And sometimes yeah. involve and Dukes bit. and Dukes. We got to go back to Dukes. We absolutely have to go back to Dukes. It's phenomenal. Oh. Uh, I think I still have a yeah. bottle of gin like in the freezer in my apartment in London, and it's just sitting there. That's true. Yeah, it's conceivable your friend may have drank it actually. Oh, <laughs> that's true. That's actually that's Better one of the it. things that I yeah I feel you know quite bad about is, is the hospitality industry in especially in places like the UK where it's been so badly hit. And, and, you know, our dear friend, Alessandro Palazzi, you know, who has managed to keep people again, like yourself upbeat by doing all these amazing videos. Like we, like, I think everyone, the point is let's, let's go back to all these places when it's when we have an opportunity again, and let's, and, and let's tip generously and drink a lot. Right. Yeah. You're here to that. That is a very fine segment and I will be on board with that 1000%. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Have a lovely day and wonderful. Thanks, Wei. Thanks for your time. It's great seeing you.